Hey, Peter Caffrey, welcome to 12 Minutes of Terror with R.J. Benetti. And you are Peter Caffrey. That's correct. Yeah. I smelled up. <laughs> How, am I doing? Yeah. How am I doing so far? Yeah, not bad, not bad. Yeah. Keep it up, I might give you a job. So Peter Caffrey, prolific author. Author? Author. Yeah. Cancer survivor? Yeah, so far. Uh, Ex-journalist? Yeah. A triathlon competitor? Participant. A self-taught chef? Self-taught chef. Well, well, nearly self-taught chef. Do you find writing? Have you always been writing? I've, I've always written. It was better, easier than working. I grew up in a family where basically you either became a doctor or a priest. And I, I just used to say I wanted to be a priest because it was less studying than being a doctor. <laughs> and then I read a lot, I wrote a lot, and then I remember the day I turned around and told my dad that actually I wasn't going to be a priest um, and I wasn't then going to get a trade because that was the, the only other alternative. Doctor, priest, get a trade, which meant getting up early in the morning, working hard, and I thought, fuck that, I'm not, that's not my kind of life. So I decided that I'd go into journalism and I told him, and he was driving on, we were dri driving home, and I said to him, I think I'm going to be a journalist. And he pulled in the car, hit the brakes, pulled in, and he looked at me in the eye and he said, Sam, you tell me one thing. Are you homosexual? <laughs> so that was, that was basically how journalists were viewed in our house. <laughs> but the priests were okay. Yeah, the priest, but the priest thing paid well. That's yeah. what I found. When we were kids, you'd have all the relatives who come out. So we come from an Irish Catholic family. So my sister would be like, oh, I want to be a doctor. And she'd get like a couple of shillings. I'd say I wanted to be a priest, and they give me 10 shillings. I thought, fucking, this pays really well. At the time, I didn't know that I had to also, you know, follow a load of rules and fuck kids. So <laughs> it was kind of, that was a shock later in life. But yeah, I was I was a, a fake wannabe priest from age six to about 14. And this, is the, this isn't the Church of England, this is the, uh, the Catholic... No, 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 fuck me, no, 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 <laughs> no. We were Catholics. Oh, that's good. I'm Catholic. Yeah, we don't believe in all that fucking divorce <laughs> and jiggery pokery. No Johnnies for us, mate. Uh, rhythm method. Yeah, I'm, a Catholic. I'm also Catholic. Are you still yeah. Catholic? Am I still Catholic? Have you read anything I write? <laughs> <laughs> well, I write weird stuff too. I guess I'm still Catholic. I'm still, I know I haven't been to church in a long time. No, I, I, I uh, no, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm not. Me, me and God, we're not great. We're not easy bedfellows. <laughs> Here's one for you, as a Catholic. Padre Pia. Yeah. His wife must be, oh, his wife. His <laughs> housekeeper must be fucking furious. They can't have cream curtains, can they? Can you imagine <laughs> that cunt touching everything? It's just a joke, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, look. He's like, whoa. <laughs> He's one of the ones that uh, after they died, they like didn't rot or they didn't uh, putrefy, you know? They just kind of looked like, they almost looked I like... They, they pickled him. <laughs> I hate you men, they just pickled him yeah. like a big old onion. <laughs> yeah, did they ho pickle Ho Chi Minh? Or was yeah, it like they that? did, they did. I yeah. went to, when I was in uh, Hanoi, I went to the Ho Chi Minh uh, mausoleum yeah. to see him, but they, they send him off to Russia once a year to get glued back together. Because <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they did a very good, I mean, it's Vietnam, they're not going to do a great <laughs> job of it, are they? They probably paint some lad on a moped, yeah, pickle him. <laughs> so yeah, they send him off to Russia uh, once a year to get touched up. <laughs> yeah, they did that <laughs> to... Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did that to Stalin too. Stalin. Yeah. I think there's another... Not Hitler. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> That'd be kind of creepy. He's beautifully preserved. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice coat and lacquer and everything. Yeah. yeah. You ever go to pick your nose and you accidentally pick your ass and you're not yeah. sure to eat it or not? Do you know, I'm going to admit this, I have never eaten my snot. I never kind of felt <laughs> that inkling. I never pulled it out and went, oh, <laughs> that. But now, talk about picking your nose. There was several times um, during my fucking cancer treatment when I was so constipated. You do that thing where you, you sat on the loo and you sat there for about three hours in the middle of the night. The whole house is quiet apart from your gentle sobbing. 
and you try everything, you do that, like, you fucking lift your knees right up to try and get it going. And I was torture. And you think, I'm going to fucking prolapse it. And there were several times where I sat there and thought, I'm going to have to just stick my finger up and start breaking it up. I'm going to have to. Because otherwise, I'm going to be here. And the closest I got, I was genuinely there one night, all night. And come the morning, I still still couldn't do anything. And when I gave up and got off the toilet, I couldn't sit down because it had obviously lodged itself. It had moved. And there was this brick of shite in my <laughs> fucking lower intestine that I could just feel. And I got so close to just sticking a finger in. Pick your nose, pick your ass. To me, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. If you've got a blockage, you just need to clear it. Yeah. And a good thing, hasn't somebody invented something for this? You've almost like one, you know, there's old Victorian chimney sweep brushes. <laughs> you almost need an anal on one of them. You wouldn't really want steel wires on it <laughs> because that would hurt going in. But you'd need something hard enough to cut through. Almost like one of them spiralizers yeah. in the kitchen yeah. from the 60s. <laughs> you want something like that, you could put it up and turn a handle and it would just shred away. Yeah, what's that brand? KitchenAid? You got the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got the anal attachment for this love. Yeah. The yeah. It's just a long finger, kind of spins. <laughs> yeah. That's what you need, yeah, a long finger. How many lab mice can you fit in your mouth? Or how many sewer rats? A lab mouse, realistically, could be any size. It all depends if they're testing growth hormones on it. I mean, you might be, you might, it might be that big. You'd be like, yeah. sewer rats, I, I don't know, maybe four. <laughs> that mice, it, it, I've got to go, exper depends on the experiment. Depends you know, on the lab. Did you ever see the mouse that had the human ear on its back? Yes, yes, you know I that? did. Did you ever see the man with the penis fingers? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, that... Charlie, I think his name, ironically, was Charlie Penis Fingers. Is this real? But, yeah, yeah, he had like... Big. <laughs> they get like these kind of bulbous fingertips, don't they? They look like big helmets. <laughs> oh, but they weren't really penises, though. Right? So I had a chemistry teacher actually when I was a kid who had penis fingers. <laughs> really? and, I, and funnily enough, his <laughs> nickname was the odd leg caliper because he had a wooden leg. <laughs> <laughs> so they just ignored the penis fingers? They went... <laughs> yeah, we, we just used to look at them and go, fucking hell, he's got one leg, that, that penis finger bloke. Yeah. I feel like if he had two good legs, his nickname would have been Penis Fingers, right? I think that could have been the case. Yeah. <laughs> or Smelly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Who does shower, though? Yeah. Huh. Who does? Do you? I mean, everybody goes, oh, yeah, personal hygiene matters to me. There comes a point where you just become self-cleansing. <laughs> well, I mean, during COVID, during COVID, there must have been... And what was your, your record during COVID for not showering or bathing? I don't know, because I have sleeping problems. So, like, if I'm, like, really, like, dirty, I can't sleep. So, I would say probably, like, three days. Three or four. Uh, yeah. I managed about ten. <laughs> yeah, really? I managed about ten before my wife went, get in the fucking shower. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you? Yeah, I'm I absolutely fucking stunk. <laughs> it started out, it started out, I just couldn't be bothered, and then I felt a bit, and then, and then I thought, I wonder how long I can do this for. <laughs> and I didn't tell her, I didn't say, oh, by the way, love, I'm not going to have a watch now for fucking ages. <laughs> I just thought, I wonder if she'll actually notice. <laughs> and she went, get in a fucking shower, you stink. <laughs> what did you do that thing, then you go in and run it. Wet your air a bit. I had some air back then. Wet your air a bit. Come out. Yeah, it's better. <laughs> you know. No, back in there. Oh, did it bother you at all, though? The stent? The smell of yourself? No. <laughs> you get used to it, don't you? Again, every now and again, you will go, Jesus, is there a dead horse in here? Yeah. And then you realise it's you. But <laughs> when you're challenging yourself, it's a bit of pride. Fun, yeah. you got to have goals. This is yeah. the problem, you know, you lock everybody up. We've got to do something to keep ourselves amused. <laughs> <laughs>
I always wonder, you know, those like prostitutes in the Wild West? They must have stopped, yeah. right? They must have... Oh, they must have been. You, you must have had it. <laughs> Use a rifle butt. <laughs> you can imagine that. And, and, yeah. and I'd imagine quite sharp. Yeah, yeah. quite crusty and, and crystalline. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you go in uncircumcised and you leave circumcised. Just, just rough in there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, so, uh, birds flying into windows. How does that make you feel? Stupid fucking bastards. Now, <laughs> I live in the middle of nowhere, and it does happen quite a lot. You've got you've got the whole fucking sky. You've got everywhere to fly. What are you going to come here for? You can see me sitting here, eating me dinner, grinning at you, because I know what you're going to do. And I go, smack, boom. They always manage to break their necks. Yeah. They don't go away days. It's not like a cartoon where they've got little fucking stars going around their head. <laughs> they break their neck and they lie there and then I have to wait until someone's feral fucking cat comes and removes <laughs> it. Because I'm not picking it up. They <laughs> heard, fuck off. <laughs> you did it. You you flew into the window. You sort it out. Is it true you used to have a pet cat and then you just it really didn't like it and then when it died you put it over your fence? And told your neighbor you didn't know whose cat that was. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? That's, well, <laughs> yeah, for all the cat lovers out there, that is not true. <laughs> However, if I had had a metaphorical cat <laughs> called Stinkhorn that happened to die in my kitchen <laughs> and I wasn't that fast, yeah, yeah, I, I, and then they said, Oh, is that your cat? I said, Which one? They said, Oh, there's a dead cat. No. Oh. No, my cat's in the house. <laughs> my cat's in the house playing the piano right now. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I had another one as well that just fucked off. And I used to see it. And it used to look at me. And I'm sure it was just going, every time I saw it, it would be sat on somebody else's wall. Some old woman was feeding it tuna. And I thought, I'm not buying tuna for you. Fucking stay there. <laughs> And, uh, sorry, you just reminded me of something. Oh, yeah. My dad had Alzheimer's before before he went into a home. <laughs> Quite regularly, my mum would go to bed at night and she'd get in bed and he'd sit up and go, what the fuck are you doing here? And she'd go, well, I'm going to sleep. He used to think she was the cleaner. <laughs> so he thought the cleaner was getting into bed with it. It's a horrible disease, <laughs> but it has benefits. You think, oh, I'm getting lucky again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a role play. <laughs> in uh, horse versus sex robots, the <laughs> robot that's got dementia, yeah. um, all the things it talks about, they're all things my dad used to say. Do. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, I just literally sat down and thought, yeah, they were gold. I mean, the best ones when I first met my missus, we went round to see uh, my mum and dad. And my mum cooked us a bit of food. And uh, my missus said, oh, I'll, I'll do the washing up. You sit and talk to your mum. And my dad said, oh, I'll take the dog out. So my dad fucked off. My missus went in the kitchen. I was sat there chatting to my mum. Must have been about an hour. And she said, uh, where is she? What's she doing? I said, oh, I'll just go and check. And I went to the kitchen and opened the door. And she was stood by the sink. And my dad was still in there. And as I opened the door, he said to her, so, what's your favourite truck? And I just I just shut the door and went back to my mum. They're just having a chat. You know? <laughs> That's great. Who's more prolific, Michael Jackson or Gary Glitter? <laughs> as a paedophile, I'm always going to say Gary Glitter um, <laughs> because he's English and... Um, <laughs> And he had a longer run. He had a much longer run than Jacko. Um, <laughs> you know, and he did it everywhere. He fucked English kids. He fucked Cambodian kids. He fucked, you know. <laughs> he, he's, and he sang fucking I'm the leader of the gang. If you go back and watch some of the videos from when he was at his pomp, he, he almost, he, if he carried a sign saying, I am a pedo, <laughs> and wore a t-shirt saying nonce, he couldn't have made it more obvious. Jacko was always, we all knew he was up to it, but <laughs> he was more in uh, trying to make himself look like a slug. <laughs> and if you look at his progression, it's, it, it gets more and more slug-like. 
<laughs> so Jacko was like a pedo slug, whereas <laughs> Gary Glitter was a rock and roll fucking monster. That <laughs> shag kids. Yeah. Both of them were, of course, entirely wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just saying that. Just saying that on the advice just of my lawyer. Yeah, just a disclaimer. <laughs> I mean, it was. I've got to admit that when Michael Jackson died, I was a little bit fucking shocked because my when my missus told me because I'd lent my strimmer to a bloke that I knew called Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. and she was like, "Michael Jackson's dead," and I was like, "Oh my god, no!" Because mm -hmm. you think, "Hang on, he's got my fucking strimmer, right?" can't go around knock on the door oh i'm really sorry your husband's dead by the way do you know where my strimmer is mm -hmm. and then you think well i'll leave it till after his funeral <laughs> and then you think hang on a minute all his relatives are going to be there some fucker's going to take that strimmer mm -hmm. no i'm sorry the poor cunt's dead but mm -hmm. he's got my fucking strimmer i was so overjoyed to find out it was the singing fucking paedophile <laughs> so i thought oh good Although the first thing I did then was I went around to Michael Jackson's house and got me fucking strimmer. He said I'm finished with it. Said I don't care. It's a risk. It's a risk I am not prepared to take. I feel like that's a UK word. What is a strimmer? Is that like a electric carving knife or something? <laughs> I don't even know. I don't know. You guys probably have some really fucking convoluted name for it, like weed whacker. Oh, weed or, whacker. Yeah, it is the name. Yeah, it's like a, a thing that cuts shit. Oh yeah, weed whacker in the garden. It's yeah. a gardening implement. I fucking hate my weed whacker. It just always It's a gardening implement breaking. that I bought, bought in error. I bought it thinking I was going to use it, and then I lent it to a couple of people, mm -hmm. and then it went in the shed. Mm -hmm. I doubt it even works anymore. Mm -hmm. So I went fucking, I went through all that stress getting it back, and I've never used it since. Do you prefer tap dancing, or just like keeping your feet flat to the ground while slowly gyrating your hips? In making eye contact with a stranger across the room. Definitely the latter. Definitely. <laughs> it, the, the, it's when you can gyrate your hips and gyrate your eyes around several strangers. <laughs> that's, that's when I think really you, you've achieved the pinnacle in the uh, socialization <laughs> state. You, that's when you know you, you've made it. Would you rather be cross-eyed or have a cleft palate? Oh, <laughs> oh, that's that's a good, that's a good. I can't really think of many downsides to having a cross a cleft palate, but there is a major downside to being cross-eyed. But it's also comedy gone <laughs> because you could always do that. No, I wasn't talking to you. You do that. You go, hey, hey, you bob cunt. You call me a bob cunt. No, I was talking to him. <laughs> talking to him over there. Yeah, you can do all that. So. That would actually be quite good. Whereas a cleft palate, all you're really going to do is go, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bit on people. yeah, no, yeah, cross eyed. Got to go for cross eyed for all that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like if you're a cleft palate, you just always have a cold tooth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And why is it people, why is it that kids with cleft palates <laughs> generally just also have a, a, a trickle of snot? <laughs> runs down into the clap. It's almost <laughs> like God when yeah, I'll fuck your mouth up, but hey, I'd tell you what I'd be really funny. <laughs> Fill it with snob. Make it into a it shouldn't actually be called Clef Palette, should it? It could be called a snot channel. <laughs> oh look, let's see that kid though, he's got a snot channel. Snot channel back to his mouth. Goes back to picking your nose and eating it, doesn't it? They're the ones, they're the lucky ones. Their fingers are fresher. They should be pianists and stuff because they ain't got to pick and eat. It's almost like, it's like draft, isn't it? It's on draft. Like the fucking whippy machine in McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, Cliff Palace, snot channel. That is true, I never thought of that. Yeah, <laughs> they, they I'm going to write to the British Medical Council. Is it true uh, you tried to start a nationwide campaign called Cats with Condoms to bring down the stray cat population in the UK? Cats and cunts, mate, yeah. cats and cunts. We've already talked about cats. <laughs> cats and cunts, really. They are, they're just the most arrogant, fickle <laughs> fucking bastards. Uh, and they eat fish. You know, that's their food of choice. Oh, a nice bit of fish. Fish is a starter, mate. Fuck <laughs> off with fish. I'll have fish to start. Cats are like, yeah, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll live in your house, I'll eat fish, and then I'm going to fuck off. Or I'm going to die and lie in the middle of your kitchen. And if you if you ever see them, I mean, now this is true of any act, they'll die 
And then they do this thing where their stomach swells <laughs> and it keeps swelling and they look really normal. They don't seem to decompose. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then they burst and they're full of maggots. And within seconds, they're just goo and tossed <laughs> about. Right? That is the life cycle of a cat, isn't it? Arrogant, arrogant, arrogant. Eat some fish, arrogant, fuck off or die. Rock. And then over the fence. <laughs> and then over the fence. Yeah. <laughs> over the fence. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm all for it. I know some people love them. <laughs> some people love kids with cleft palates. <laughs> you know, it's, it's to their own. I'm not saying... I'm not saying don't believe in God. I'm not saying don't own a cat. I'm not saying don't suck snot through a cleft palate. But I'm saying not for me. Not for me, mate. Uh, so you want to play a game? Yeah, go on then. It's called twats or cunts. <laughs> twats. Tw it's twats. Twats. Twats? I always thought twat. it was twat. Twat. For the English twat. shot. Twat. 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 Not hot, twat. <laughs> Not hot as in hot, hat as in hat. Twat. Twats or cunts. So I'm going to name yeah. some people and you tell me if they're a twat or a cunt, right? Uh, Gandhi. <laughs> twat. Uh, John Stamos. Never heard of him. <laughs> so what is he? Like <laughs> uh, Uday Hussein. Come. <laughs> Prince Harry. Come. David Beckham. Come. <laughs> the Spice Girls. Twats. <laughs> Ed Gein. Come. <laughs> Tiny Tim. Come. Frankenstein's Monster. Twat. Dr. Frankenstein. Come. <laughs> Count Chocula. Come. Elmer Fudd. Come. Elon Musk. <laughs> Come. Anakin Skywalker. Come. <laughs> now, now, I'll say something now. <laughs> I know I know off the name. I have never watched a Star Wars film in my life. <laughs> because I don't watch children's fucking <laughs> gobbledygook films, right? <laughs> When I meet adults who tell me how great Star Wars is, this is what I fucking hear. <laughs> Me, I'm a cunt. Right? I say, right? I'm not interested. I don't want to know. Right? They're all cunts. Anybody who does that, and Star Trek, they're the same fucking thing. People who like Star Trek don't like people who like Star Wars. You're watching the same thing. <laughs> Just, they've just got different names. That's a bit like going, do you like a willy or a, or a cock? No. <laughs> Same fucking thing, mate. Go, just rub it out. There's no point. I feel like a willy and a cock, they're like they're like penises with different attitudes, right? <laughs> like a willy is more a kind of a kind of a lounger. A willy's younger. Yeah, a willy. The, the willy, if you show a girl your willy, it's kind of... <laughs> It's a moment of <laughs> self-exploratory <laughs> excitement when you are a juvenile. If you show her your cock, you're hoping that there'll be some sort of reciprocal action <laughs> upon the cock. So yeah. 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 So maybe that's not the right way to describe it. I feel like there's a lot of like kind of like pet names for wieners that are kind of like a willy, you know? But you don't have that with a vagina. Like yeah, you do. No, I mean, yeah. Pussy, pussy, twat, growler. But you don't have, like, quote-unquote cute names for a vagina. You know? Like... Cunt. <laughs> Stench trench. Butcher's window. <laughs> piss flaps. <laughs> What's not cute about that? I've never heard that one. Yeah. <laughs> when I was... Um, I, I tell you, nothing to do with, with, with words for female genocide. When um, my granddaughter was about four or five, I used to pay her to shout out bull sacks really loud in public places. How's she doing now? <laughs> yeah, she's doing all right. She's quite, she's quite level-headed. <laughs> it didn't affect her at all? No, no. Uh, so I have some questions here from uh, Karina. 
RHCP Morse. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> yeah, just tell it. Cats are cunts. <laughs> What's your favorite nipple, left or right? Middle. <laughs> are you really Jimmy the Chimp? I can't discuss Jimmy the Chimp in the, <laughs> without my solicitor being present. <laughs> One time you mentioned that you got the idea for Jimmy the Chimp because you grew up with a taxidermy chimp in your room or something like that? Yeah, yeah. My 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 father used to just buy all manner of shit. He would go to the pub. He was he was a very hard working man, but his one flaw was that at the end of the week he would go to the pub, he would get absolutely shit faced, and he would come home with something odd that he bought. <laughs> and invariably my mother would tell him to get rid of it. <laughs> so if it was something atrocious, but he thought it was quite funny, he would go, no, it's for Pete. So mm -hmm. I ended up with all this garbage. So yeah, stuffed chimp. Um, I, I had a dead hamster for my birthday once. <laughs> dead hamster in a cage, which I called Snoozy, because I thought it was always asleep. But after three months of getting it on the table and it, it cracked the table, I realised it was possibly dead. So yeah, um, just all mad clocks that didn't work he was once he'd had a few beers he was a salesman's dream yeah and i used to talk to it i used to confide in it and at night it would tell me to do things it would say oh, i've got a good idea just fucking just, just go and stab everybody in the house i don't know i didn't see that one through but it would tell me things and it used to say things like do you know what would be fun set something on fire today so I had a little spell as a kid where I, I enjoyed arson, um, go to the woods and scream at a tram, all that kind of stuff. It would tell me to do, and, and yeah, I kind of remembered it. And in, in a way, sometimes in adult life, I look back in fondness and I think, what would Jimmy Chet tell me to do right now? <laughs> you know, you're stood there, the police are there with their tasers out. <laughs> You've got the old woman and the knife her throat. You think, what would Jimmy do? It's a bit like what would Jesus do, but better because Jimmy was real and Jesus wasn't. There was a lovely period that I grew up in where things are very collectible and expensive now. People threw in skips. I remember somebody trying to give away a whole stuffed fucking bear, a proper taxidermy bear, because people didn't want it. So <laughs> There was every chance it could have been a chimp. There was every chance it could have been something from a fucking fairground. I mean, I was I was a kid. To me, <laughs> it was a chimp in a case. <laughs> it, was, me. it was in a case? It was in a kind of like a glass. Very <laughs> sort of badly mottled. <laughs> you know when you get that kind of patina on glass? That, yeah. yeah, it was like that. It was, it was about yay big. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a hideous fucking thing. And the thing was all, like, molting and, you know, <laughs> it was the, the sort of thing that if your husband brought it home from a pub pissed, you'd be like, fuck off. <laughs> they went, oh, it's for Peter, and I, I took it because of, I needed a friend. In a way, I'm really gutted I didn't keep it. I've kept a lot of stuff from, you know, like the god of wanking still <laughs> exists. <laughs> In so, fact, he's in, he's in this fucking room. There he is, aren't there? Is there have, you not seen, have you never seen it? <laughs> no, I haven't seen it. Growing up in an Irish Catholic family, <laughs> our house was filled with everything. Crucifixes, pictures of the Sacred Heart, statues of the Child of Prague. All that fucking nonsense was everywhere. So as you grew up and discovered the, the joys of masturbation. Wherever you went in the house to do it, God would be looking at you in one of his many guises, or his mum. They'd be staring at you going. There was one room that was like a spare room that all the junk got put in, and there was nothing in there. And we had an aunt who married an airman from Virginia after the, uh, after the war and went back to live there. And when she came back over, she bought me a collection of this shite, really, typical shite. And one of the things was this little totem pole. And it ended up being shoved in the in the spare room. And if you went in and saw him, it was almost like he was going, go on, <laughs> knock one out. Oh, yeah. Like that. Oh! <laughs> oh! That's nice. so that, 
So oh. it became known as the Golden Wanky. I was going to say, and anyway, I left home, went away. And years later, I was talking to my younger brother, and he said, it's still in the house, you know, still there. We were talking about it, and I said, no. Nah. So we, we went and pretended to go and see my mother out of the kindness of our hearts so we could steal it and get it back, liberate it, because it was, it was trapped in a house of God. <laughs> and nobody was masturbating in front of it. So we went and got it. And that's actually where the, the idea for the book came from that. Your brother used well, to do it in front of the God of Wanking too? He was aware of it because I told him about it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure he, he grew up there. I mean, there's 15, 16 years between. Them. <laughs> so I'd left home and he was still there. So I dare say he'd uh, <laughs> offered something to it at some yeah. point. Yeah, people say when your ancestors die when they're in heaven. They have to watch you every time you masturbate. I hope so. I really <laughs> hope so. Especially my Uncle Eddie, who used to, every time every time he'd come round, he didn't drink because he was a bit of a lush. And when we were kids, he'd come round, come round at Christmas, and he'd say to me, Mum and Dad, oh, you go to the parabolic after the kids. Mm. Seconds after they were out the door, he used to strip down to his underpants. And be like, Let's wrestle for jelly tops. And you'd be like, I don't want fucking jelly. No, we're wrestling. So now I hope he has to watch. Yeah, fucking right. Have that, Eddie, you bald twat. Does your uncle? <laughs> was he like a, was he a nonce? Uh, he, he never got very far because we were, we were quite feral as children. <laughs> but he always, he always wanted to wrestle and we just, we just mock him. And the other thing that I used to do was I used to spit on his head because <laughs> he, had, he had like a proper bald, shiny head. And uh, he used to fall asleep in the chair and I'd then spit on his head. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Eddie. <laughs> Uncle Eddie, yeah. <laughs> jelly tots, fuck off. You know. <laughs> I remember telling my sister, and I said, Eddie keeps stripping out his underpants and asking me to wrestle for daily tops. And she said, why don't you tell Dad? And I said, I don't think Dad likes jelly tops. <laughs> and it was like, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it was normal. I'm not saying we were non stoner or anything. But, you know, it was the fucking 60s. That's what people do. Everybody goes, oh, the 60s must have been great. Jimi Hendrix, Jefferson Airplane. No. It was fucking bald uncles in underpants <laughs> trying to launch you off. Come on, let's wrestle. Grease me up like a pig. <laughs> oh, it must have been great at Woodstock. So acupuncture? Do you ever acupuncture? Have you? Yeah, a load of fucking hokum poker. <laughs> right? <laughs> fucking spiritual healing, rage, <laughs> auras. What a load of fucking old bollocks. <laughs> it's just nonsense, isn't it? What people have paid for now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, oh, I can feel that your spirit's out of line. You've got to clear your chakras. Fuck off. How <laughs> oh, good days work. I'll sort you out, you lazy bastards. <laughs> yeah, acupuncture. Oh, yeah. I was going to just say something stupid. Like, uh, do you ever think humans are just voodoo dolls for giants? No, but it would be good. It would be appropriate for some humans. <laughs> Have you ever seen that cupping when people put those cups on their back? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I think every time I see somebody with cups on? I think you cunt. That's cost you about 40 quid. <laughs> off your head and it'll do fuck all for you. It's like, it's basically, it's like getting your dog to give you a love bite when you're a kid. <laughs> yeah. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> like, oh man. Do you, do you guys in America do that old fucking hoover on the cock thing? <laughs> no, I know. I'm sure people have done it. I've heard of it. One time I was in a jacuzzi as a teenager and I, I tried to try to put my stuff there. It just hurt really bad. My my brother in law is a surgeon <laughs> and he does he does most of his stuff is bowel stuff. So he's great at parties. If you go to a family gathering and you're bored, you just sidle over to him and he'll show you things on his phone that he's found up people's asses, like <laughs> x-rays and stuff. So it's always good fun. But there is a specific brand. He, he went to America to do some lectures and there was a specific brand of Hoover that was responsible for about 
80% of penile lacerations <laughs> because people were fucking it. But what they were doing was they were measuring their cock and measuring the gap through to the fat. But because of the level of suction and the excitement of humping these hoovers, it was further engorging them. <laughs> and they were getting the ends of their cocks chopped off. <laughs> and somebody had written a fucking paper on this and he was doing lectures he was doing lectures about the arts and they were doing but they were doing a thing about penal arts and he said it is so big <laughs> that the company that made the hoover had to rebrand itself i don't know what it's called it's some american but <laughs> um, yeah but you see it, it, you know if you think about it I, I mean i remember when i was you know somebody had a hoover and they used to do a lad we knew used to give himself love bites <laughs> with the hoover so he could pretend he had a girl but yeah you see that cut in him you think oh fucking grow up do you know marion from mothers of mayhem yeah the co-host but, yeah uh, she's a she works on emergency uh, she's a nurse in the emergency ward. She said, she told me like a couple months ago, she just messaged me that uh, I need to put this in one of my stories that this guy came in and he had uh, shoved a magic eight ball up his ass. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I asked her like, did he shove it? So like that little glass screen where you could yeah, see. Yeah, so you could see. <laughs> yeah. So it's in the asshole. And she said he actually did. He shoved it. So the little fortune you could see out the ass and he could like shake his ass and it would tell you. You're <laughs> and, What's he going to the hospital for? What was wrong with that? Well, he must have done something else because that's <laughs> That sounds to me like a result. <laughs> well, supposedly this guy thought it was really funny, but you know those things are like probably like this big. Yeah. And uh, I was like, well, what what ended up happening? She said he had to have massive surgery. <laughs> oh, it's 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 not easy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my brother-in-law was telling me that everybody always has a story, and it's like, oh, I was it was really hot, so I took all my clothes off, and I was hoovering, <laughs> and I fell. <laughs> and I staggered backwards and ended up sitting on the coat pot. They always had a story like that. And he had a guy who came in with a, a little statue of uh, a, a model of the Eiffel Tower shoved up his ass. And he said to him, how did it happen? And the bloke said, stuck it up my ass to see what it felt like. <laughs> he's the only one in who's been doing it about 40 years. He said he's the only one who's ever said, yeah, stuck it up my ass to see what it was like. Oh, I think top marks to it. But you know, I said to him, do you have a shelf in your office with all the stuff on? And he said, no, we have, by law, we have to give it back. It's their property. He said, what they do with it is up to them, but we have to give it back. <laughs> do they disinfect it before they give it back? Or is it just kind of... Oh, I doubt it. You just throw it in a bag, <laughs> wouldn't you? But there you go. <laughs> it's a shitty eight ball, mate. Yeah, it's a shitty Ziploc bag, all shit marks and shit on Take that, take that, <laughs> and you keep with the fucking big snot channel down his face and fuck <laughs> off out the hospital. Here's a question for you. Uh, people often evacuate their bowels when they die. Knowing that, what would you choose as your last meal? Probably very small plastic yellow ducks. <laughs> a big bowl of them. And you can imagine that you'd be laying there and you're just voiding. And it would just be a flurry of shit. With all these tiny little yellow ducks, <laughs> because you know you've got to spread a little happiness. <laughs> in right. death, there must be joy. Yeah. So you grew up uh, with punk rock in the '70s. This is kind of like Drew Stefik wants me to ask you this. There's oh, nothing... fucking course he would. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing funny about the question. <laughs> oh, oh dear. <laughs> it's just you grew up with punk rock in the '70s. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I grew up with punk rock in the '70s. We just weren't very cool kids. We weren't fashionable. We weren't witty. We weren't greatly hygienic. We were spotty, disaffected youth that <laughs> hung around and didn't really fit in. And then all of a sudden, something happened that made us cool. <laughs> and we realized that not only did it fit our, our psyche, but it also meant that we could get our hand up the jumper of girls wearing fishnet stockings. And we thought, hang on, this is this is a bit of all right. So we did that for about two or three years. And then it became very popular. And we thought, fuck this, this is boring. <laughs> it was great. I mean, in all seriousness, and I hate to be serious, <laughs> it was almost perfect timing because we, we we missed the 70s. We missed the late 60s, early 
Nazis. So it was a very, very conservative time. Um, I mean, literally, people were ashamed of getting pregnant outside of marriage. You didn't live with people you weren't married to. Um, if you didn't wear a brown car coat and corduroy trousers, you were frowned upon as a weirdo. It, it was a very, very different time. And in the middle of it, something really bizarre happened. And we were kind of part of it. And it was, I look back on it all my life as being glorious. It was just, it was a blip. If you look at how long it lasted as well, it only lasted a couple of years. And it was just a little blip in time that now we see change so much. But at the time, it was, it was our youth. So we didn't realise how different it was. <laughs> but it was... I, I think it defined me, it defined a lot of my friends, it defined one of my one of my siblings, you know, and it, it it's it still remains an essential part of the way we look at the world. Yeah. And it's to me, success isn't about it's not about making money and doing loads of things. It's about doing something different. And I do it when I when I sit down to write something, I don't think, oh, what can I write that's popular? I think, what can I write that's different, that's that's amusing? It's got to amuse me. And I, I think to me, punk, you know, a lot of people historically look back at punk rock and go, it was a great social movement. It wasn't. We were just pissing about. People were going, you can't do that. And they were going, what if we do? What if we do? What if we really go and do? What if we come up with a band that can't play music and just go out and scream and fucking make noise? What if we make clothes out of fucking old shit? What if, you know, and that was it. That was what we did. And then it was almost like when everybody took the joke seriously and wanted to be part of it, we went, that's it, over. Did, so that does influence, you would say, because your writing is, you're definitely one of the, my favourite like authors I've come across with godless Thank you very much, in, in recent time that means a lot coming from you no i appreciate that but yeah you have such a unique voice and then even uh just reading the stuff is hilarious well written weird and then uh when you do your audio books it's like the best productions i've ever heard like your um mondo perverso and also the bedtime stories audiobooks how did you learn to do all that i i, I didn't really i just I... I had, I had in my head, with Mondo Perverso, I had in my head what I wanted to do. And I wanted it to be so cheesy. I wanted, I wanted that almost 1970s shit cinema vibe <laughs> that I remember. And it didn't matter how many times I wrote it, I realised that unless you'd been there, you wouldn't know what it was like. So that almost vaudeville organ thing that they used to have going on in you know before an art film people wouldn't know what that was like unless they were there and it doesn't matter how you write it everybody is going to relate it to what they do now and it occurred to me that the only way to do it was to try and produce it it comes across so much better than trying to write it because it is a mood it's not the stories, fine, I can write those. But the the whole feeling of being in that building, that stinky building, it works audio-wise. Just involved a lot of Googling. And then once I got to bits that I liked, I just wrote macros to make sure that they were repeatable. <laughs> yeah, I put uh, the first one I listened to, I think I was going to go on a hike, and I just put it on in my car because I hadn't heard the audio yet. And I was like, what the fuck is that? It was the greatest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> then Terry Funicular is uh, speaking to an audience about his lost movies. And then you have the, you have even the trailers for other <laughs> movies. Yeah, yeah. Well, that and the adverts. And I wanted to be just like, and I can still remember adverts from going to the cinema when I was a kid that were just fucking cheesy and sold nothing. I did with, with, with the whole Terry Funicular thing, he's obviously the, a character from Fucked Up Bedtime Stories and he's the nonce, the nonce uncle. I just got thinking about what films would he make and they fitted in with that. And 
the whole thing just came together actually as a I wonder if this would be possible. I sat down, I had nothing to do. I think my missus had gone away for a couple of days to see a friend. And I was sat around, I didn't have a lot to do. I think I was still undergoing cancer treatment, so I was too knackered to go out and do anything. I, I didn't really like going out. I didn't like being far away from medication. And I just thought, I've got time. I'll have a little play with this. And I started playing around with it. And I think in two days, I did the intro to Nympho Nurses' Turn Up Terror. Just like, I think I did the intro bit, the trailer and the advert. And I sat listening to them. And every time I listened to them, I hate it when, when I laugh at my own stuff. Mm -hmm. But I sat there and I just kept laughing at them. And I thought, I've just, I've just got to do this. It took ages to produce each one, but I just, I really enjoyed doing them. Yeah, I mean, they're brilliant. Same thing with the uh, fucked up bedtime stories. Well, my, my, my daughter's always saying, you should you should write kids' books. <laughs> I don't know why, because she's never actually fucking read anything I've written. <laughs> and so fucked up bedtime stories was originally written, or the, the, it was started as a series of children's stories <laughs> for my granddaughters. <laughs> and the original working title was Arnold, Why Are You Such a Cunt? <laughs> and I thought, yeah, maybe I'll get away with that. <laughs> and then I wrote the first one and I thought, nah, this isn't going to flow. <laughs> Can't really do this for kids. But by then, I, I was kind of in love with, with Arnold and Jimmy and, and mm. the whole concept of it. It reminds me of a really fucked up, messed up Calvin and Hobbes. Really? You've got like a horrible little shit of a demented child with an imaginary fucking friend who's a satanic necromancer. Yeah. It's fairly standard fare, really. <laughs> well, hey, this has been, uh, I mean, this has been an absolute blast. You definitely... That's been very yeah. enjoyable. Yeah, you have to come back. Well, uh, yeah. Definitely keep yeah. in touch. All right. Okay, okay. mate. Twat. Come. Come. Twat. Come. Twa, come, twa, come.